Mickey Kendall, welcome to Livewire. Thank you for having me on. You've said in this book that uh, some people see you as, uh, you know, fiercely feminist, and then other people, depending on who you ask, might see you as toxic. Uh, are you comfortable in that place of, of being a, a person who different people have really different perceptions of? Oh, absolutely. There's a saying, um, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I like living right there in that spot. If someone is having a hard time, I'm not going to be mean to them. I'm not going to go out of my way to be nasty. But if you show up and you want to be a bully, I'm your huckleberry. I'm right here <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> Um, how exactly do you define the hood, Mickey Kendall? Um, in my case, because I grew up on the south side of Chicago, the hood is candy ladies and the guy that sometimes hangs around the alley and the corner boys serving and corner boys will also take your grandma's groceries upstairs for the record. But the hood could also be on a reservation. It could be the barrio. It could be. The holler, right? We see a lot of mm. low income communities, rural income, rural low income communities kind of ascribe to that same aesthetic of, oh, there's nothing of value there. And the thing is, it's not that the hood doesn't have answers. It's not that the people in those places don't have answers. What they don't have is resources. Mm-hmm. So the hood would be, uh, in, in your definition, somewhere where people are trying to survive and are being deprived of the resources and the attention that they really need and deserve. And that could look like almost anywhere. That could look like any low income community in America or abroad, because fundamentally, most of us have seen this this data. People in low income communities reach out to help each other more than people in high income communities will reach out to help each other. And I think that sometimes people will ascribe to the hood all of these negative tropes while ignoring the positives. So I want people to think about this low income community. Why do you think it's so bad? Why do you think it's scary? What services are in your community that are not in that community? It could be buses, it could be streetlights, it could be functional schools, it could be clinics, it could be access to medical care, Mm -hmm. right? All of Mm -hmm. those things, communities that are bad, usually are communities that don't have things like grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't have basic things that are present in higher income communities, but there's no reason for them not to be present there. Poor people buy food too. Mm -hmm. Right, on the subject of which, uh, one of the things that you write about in this book that I hadn't thought of from the perspective that you bring up is this typically white kind of proud of themselves folks that uh, enact like a soda ban yes. maybe in a, in a city because they want to try to keep those poor people off of that sugary drink. That's right. And, and, and you talked about it in a way that I had not occurred to me. Can you talk about that a little bit? I'm going to point out that people who back soda bans generally will say, what's well, it protect kids teeth? If you want to protect kids and their health and their weight or their teeth or whatever, they bring up weight a lot, too. Wouldn't you be more concerned with the lead in their water? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you be more concerned with the lack of grocery stores in their communities? If you were concerned about health, wouldn't your focus be on making the community healthy and not on taxing people with the lowest incomes for having something they enjoy? And also, for the record, as we saw in Flint, One of the few sources of clean, untainted water was in a soda can because the soda companies were getting lead-free water when the community was not. That's one of the things that I really treasure about this book is, like, thinking about policy in a way that is listening more broadly. It was, I mean, really helpful for me as somebody who was like, oh, sure, yeah, soda, we should tax, you know. No, like, we should think about how this is represented across all communities in the country before we make a decision that's based on one particular community's view of how that functions. I was going to say, well, especially because when we talk about soda and the amount of sugar in soda, we don't do that judging about Starbucks. Right, like a triple frappuccino. <laughs> right. There is a Starbucks near our house where I swear to God, that line never goes down. There are cars in line picking up whatever triple Frappuccino, unicorn Frappuccino, whatever they are, all day long. I'm cautious about asking this next question, Mickey, because I know that there's a lot of stuff around kind of emotional labor and particularly white people asking people of color to explain to them how to be better white people. But in in reading your book... You know, there's a lot of stuff in there that I know is probably challenging for people, particularly maybe white women who consider themselves feminist and would think of themselves as allies. I guess in the with the danger of asking you to do the emotional labor of explaining to folks how to act, like what would you hope people would take away from this book? Um, and, and what would you like to see people do who have done harm but maybe didn't realize it and now feel a little called out by this book? 
So a couple things. If you can make amends, make amends. Some people you're not going to be able to get to accept your apology and you're just going to have to hold that. Then try not to do the same thing again. Let's like, let's start there, right? And then from that, look at what you're doing and what policies you're supporting, what politicians you're supporting. Sometimes doing the right thing can be as simple as not backing people who are doing the wrong thing. It can be donating to better campaigns, following the lead of people already doing the work, right? Whether that is of donating political campaigns or donating to violence intervention or bail funds or uh, mutual aid societies, right? If you have more than enough and the best you can do is to put some money in the hat, put some money in the hat. If you have the ability to volunteer and not make it all about making yourself feel better, cool, do that. But Speaking up for the right thing, even if it's sometimes a little risky, is really the transition from ally to accomplice. Mm. And in terms of being an accomplice, that's where you show up at the school board meeting and say, you know what? Our building doesn't need an extension, but that community school that's crumbling around their ears, they could use a new building. They could use funds. That could mean, you know, speaking up and not making cutesy little thumbs down gestures in Congress to vote against minimum wage increases. Mm. And instead, I don't know, supporting people getting paid enough to live on in the middle of a pandemic. Sounds great. <laughs> like a wild idea. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> what, I'm just curious, Mickey, your personal philosophy in how you move through the world when you're dealing with a group of people and a lot of different people in that group have different needs that need to be met. And sometimes it would seem that those needs could come into conflict with each other or it could be sort of zero sum. Uh, how do you navigate those worlds? Um, so I, I tend to aim for the lowest common denominator, right? Everybody needs to eat. Everybody needs good housing. Everybody needs a safe space, right? And you'd be amazed how many people in that conflicting room of needs don't actually have all of their needs met at the most basic levels, right? Mm. So that person who's really hyped up about, let's say they want their student loan debt forgiven, right? And someone says, well, but what about all these homeless people? Well, the person who's worried about their student loan debt is worried about becoming homeless and the homeless per person is worried about being housed, right? So then we have to sit and have this conversation about how we can work together to meet the most basic need, common mm. need in the group. If someone has got something that's really outside the box, right, that's not on that Maslow's hierarchy of basic mm. needs, well, then that's when we have the conversation about what is it that you're pursuing, right? And what is it that you need? And what do you think this group needs to provide for you? Because even though I am not an organizer and I am not good at organizing things, I am really good at getting people to stop and ask themselves, is this need the most urgent one in the room? Mm -hmm. Does it need to be met right now? That's great. You'd be amazed how many people will realize, oh, wait, I'm not worried about housing. I'm not worried about food. These people are. Mm. I can wait a few minutes or however long till we solve that problem. It's not that, that all the needs shouldn't be met usually in that room. It's the order in which they should be met. Unless, of course, we have someone who's a super bigot, in which case they need to leave the room, which is a separate part of my personality. Mm. Huh. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, this, this book, you know, points out a lot of things that we need to do better on. And, and that, you know, we are in a country that's in the middle of a pandemic and that has a lot of reckoning still to do around race and gender. Um, is there something, though, that gives you hope? Oh, I absolutely am hopeful about some of the things we're seeing. Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to give politicians a lot of flowers here, but I will say seeing that some of the legislation out of this administration does focus on poor people is a good sign. Seeing how many young people, right? And we're going to go with Generation Z. And I know people are going to be like, well, they're so mean to millennials, but like, get over it. You'll be all right. <laughs> I'm still eating, even if my feelings are hurt on, on Twitter, right? Right. Like, so, the hierarchy of need. Right. They're advocating for much a much better world in many places. Yeah. Um, one of the things, the other things I'm seeing is people start to realize Oh, those social safety nets that we thought we didn't need, we need them. We should support them and rebuild them. Does that mean that we are looking at a perfect, smooth ride? Absolutely not. I would like to welcome you to American politics. Um, you're probably going to have to hold the politician accountable and maybe arrest a handful before it's over. I'm from yeah. Illinois. We send our governors to jail. I feel like yeah. more states should try that. Just Yeah, that's like every five years they just ship one off. 
they deserve it. They brought it <laughs> on themselves. Um, but I, I do see some good things. I see people starting to engage not just with my work, but with the work of a lot of other people and starting to really think about those basic needs being met. Oddly enough, not that I want the pandemic to have happened or for anyone to have died. I think a lot of people seeing the different responses globally has made them realize how little they're getting for their tax dollars, right? We always hear about my tax dollars. Well, your tax dollars should have taken care of you during this. And they're still fighting about a $1,400 check. Right. Yeah. There were politicians saying that they were worried about giving people $1,400 because they would all quit their jobs. And I was like, what, for two weeks? Like, take this job and shove it for 11 to 13 days until I will be out of this money and then, of course, still need my job. Right, like, whose rent is still... <laughs> rent plus food is covered by $1,400 for right. longer than maybe a month and probably not that long. Yeah. Well, Mickey Kendall, this is a really fascinating book, and I have to say that it uh, it was challenging for me at times to read, but it also really made me think about the world differently. So thanks for writing it, and thanks for coming on the Livewire House Party. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. It was great to meet both of you.